Okay, okay, let's talk about the idea of a 15 minute farm. Yes, you heard me right. 15 minute farm. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking about our farm here in Northern Vermont and how I wanna make it a 15 minute farm. And as I was thinking about some of the things that would be required to make my farm a 15 minute farm, I figured that other people might be interested in that as well. And so we're gonna be talking about it today. Good morning, large white farm dogs. How's it going? Hey, Toby dog, how's it going, buddy? You both seem very happy this morning. Yes, good to see you both. Come on, dogs, let's go. So lately I've been thinking about the future of our farm and that's what got me on this topic of the 15 minute farm specifically. I gotta give the dogs their supplements first. Sit please. Good boy, you've been a very good girl. Yes, good job. And as I've been thinking about the future of my farm, I've also been doing a lot of reading. And one book in particular that I've been reading is a book by a guy by the name of Ben Hartman. It's called The Lean Farm. Oh, the dogs like the fresh water, yeah. So you see, Ben was a farmer out in Indiana where he ran a market garden. And what he did in this lean farming book was he documented the process where he took like the lean manufacturing capability and mindset that was sort of pioneered in Japanese automakers and he applied it to his farm. And by applying these lean manufacturing capabilities to his farm, Ben found that he was able to make his farm more efficient, it required less of his time, and he was more profitable. Which I personally would say is like the beginning farmer's dream, where right now, as I look at our farm, even though we've been doing this for about five years now, I still feel like we're much too inefficient. We have too much wasted time. We have wasted resources. And I just could be doing things a whole heck of a lot better. Which is why, as I sat there reading this book, I became so enthralled with so many of the concepts that were inside the book. Because over the last couple of years, I have worked to make my farm more efficient. I mean, heck, even two winters ago, I could come out here and you'd see me dragging buckets of water out to my birds. And now these days, I'm doing everything pretty much by hose. Or for another example, if you just look at how I keep my birds now, it has become significantly more efficient and so much easier for me as the farmer. Release the Quacker! In fact, I think my new winter home for my birds has gotten so good that they barely ever want to leave it. And in fact, I have to use food to motivate them to come outside. But in all seriousness, if you look at how this coop was designed, it makes so much sense. I only have to clean the coop out once every spring, and all I'm doing to keep things clean and fresh in here is I just keep adding more and more layers of fresh bedding, and it keeps the birds clean and healthy and dry, and it creates a lot more compost for me. And as far as my mobile chicken coop goes, I have special nesting boxes that now keep all my eggs nice and clean. And based on the way the floor is designed, if I want to get things clean, I just have to brush the poop through the slots and it goes down on the ground. And the birds like the roosts up here. I also added an automatic door here to raise and shut when nightfall hits. So when the sun rises, the door opens, and when the sun sets, the door closes. That means realistically, when it comes to doing chicken chores, that's only one time a day I need to interact with the chickens, which if I'm tracking my time like a business-minded farmer saves me money and makes me more efficient. Any eggs in here? Nope, not yet. I think that girl's just about to lay. Is that right, sweetie? You sure have a lot to say, I know that. But as I was thinking about the lean farm and some of the principles in this lean farming book, one of the connections I made in my brain was back to when I was initially studying permaculture. You see, permaculture is a design system where you're essentially creating these agricultural landscapes that essentially have harmony with nature, but then also provide resources for people and animals and other creatures. And as I was getting ready to start my farm, it was one of the things that I studied a lot and paid a lot of attention to. And it influenced a lot of my thinking as I thought about about designing this farm in the first phase. But at this stage of the game, I'm getting ready for essentially what's the second phase of my farm. Good morning, macho man. How's it going, buddy? Take two giant steps back for me. Come on, pal. Come on over here. Let's brush you out. Come on, we're gonna get you your first brushing of the day. Come on. You see, when I first moved up to this farm back in 2018, I had this dream of one day being able to focus on the farm full time. I was essentially able to realize that dream back in January of 2022 when I quit my full time job. And now pretty much the only way I earn my living is the either stuff that I make and grow from the farm or by making videos like these for you guys. Better watch out, Ginny. I don't think Randy likes you very much. 
Easy, buddy. Easy, easy, easy. You want brushing, I know, I can tell. Yeah, you want me to scratch your neck just like that? Okay. But back to the idea of permaculture. One of the founding principles in permaculture is the idea that permaculture landscapes have zones. You know, essentially you have like zone zero, which is where you live like inside your house. Jenny, I don't want you doing that. And then you have like zone one, which is where maybe like your garden is, or you have your chickens, or zone two, where you have your larger livestock, like these guys. Then you have maybe zone three, which is further out in the areas like your farther reaches of pasture. And then you'll find zone four, which is the areas of your farm, which you very rarely ever use, like the woodlots and the forest and that sort of thing. And heck, if, even if you look at how our farm is laid out today, it's very much built around those permaculture zones. You know, you have essentially zone zero, which is our house, and then you walk out the door and you march a couple of steps. And you can see our kitchen garden that we have. And then you come to the barn, which is where we store a lot of our equipment and tools and that sort of thing. And then you come a little further out and you come to the bird yard, which is where all the ducks, geese, and chickens live. You also have this barnyard, which particularly in the winter, is important for housing the cattle. But then as you look further back on our farm, you can see like where we have the permaculture orchard, which I would consider like a zone three type of area, or the larger pasture, which is like the edge of zone three going into zone four. And then even though our farm is 160 acres or so, we actually have about 110 of those acres in woodlot. So most of our farm is in fact what you would consider zone four in permaculture. Which brings me back to the concept of the 15 minute farm. Come on, Randy. We're gonna try this without the bucket today. Come on. Whoa, whoa, no, no, no. Come on, Randy. Good boy, good boy. Hi, good to see you. You're getting so pretty with those bangs. You know that girl? You are gonna be a pretty, pretty cow. There's no question about it. So yes, when I think about a 15 minute farm, essentially what I'm thinking about is a farm where you design your layout so that you can go from every single point of your farm that you need to do your daily chores from in 15 minutes or less. And for the winter time period here on our farm, I genuinely wanna design our farm in a way where that continues to be the case. You know, oftentimes when there is a rare chance when a visitor ends up coming to the farm, and by the way, if you wanna win a chance to come to visit the farm, there's a special link down below you should check out. Hey, Bonnie McMurray, would you like to try some too? One of the things that those visitors will often say to us is, they're always surprised by how close everything is together on our farm. There you go. Hey, Ariel. That's my favorite cow. They're shocked to see that the cattle yard is like mere feet away from where the bird yard is. They're shocked to see this narrow alleyway where I drive my tractor up and down to feed hay. They're also surprised to see just how close our farm and our house is to the street. Come here, Ariel. There you go. So Ariel is the mother of Bonnie. Oh, but here comes Audrey, the boss cow. They know I have treats, so they're like getting a little aggressive in here. Audrey's like, where's my treat? I'm sorry, Audrey, I just gave away all the treats. I don't have any. I know, but you're still a good girl. You know, when people hear about a guy who lives on 160 acres on a farm in the middle of nowhere, I think they have visions of the farm being like dead set middle of your acreage. Whereas if you look at where our house is on our farm's property, it's like if it was a postage envelope, the house would go where the stamp was. And that wasn't something that was designed by us. That was something that was put into place in, I don't know, the 1830s when our house was built. Because when you had a house or homestead back then, in Vermont, you didn't want to have a long driveway or be very far from the road. You wanted to be right on the road. That made it easier to travel when there was four feet of snow on the ground. When this barn was a dairy farm, it made it easier to do the butter and milk pickup so that the product could then be taken to Boston. And even if you look at how the farm's barn was designed, it had that kind of similar principle in mind where, you know, the third floor of our barn was where they would store the hay so that it was really easy to just take a hay cart where you pulled the hay off the field and bring it up that hill and up that ramp onto the third floor where you could store your hay. And then on the second floor of the barn, if you've seen pictures or video of it, that's where the milking stalls were and they would milk the cattle. And then on the first floor was actually where they'd store all the manure. And so if you look back like to 1900, when our house was fully connected to the barn, you could easily do all of your winter chores with the cattle without ever having to set foot outside. Now, I'm not saying that that's a goal of mine for the farm where I can do all my winter chores without ever having to go outside. In fact, I quite like coming outside even when it's 25 degrees below zero. But what I am saying is I really do want to think about the footprint of my farm and how I continue to make it more efficient. So for example, as we build new infrastructure like the barn that's going to go up at the front of the house where we have our workshop and equipment storage, I genuinely want to think 
think about how I connect that area with the other chores that I have to do around our farm. And then even more importantly, when I think about where do I wanna house my cattle in the future when my herd say grows to like 25 or 30 animals, I'm wondering if this barn area is gonna be sufficient or if I'm not gonna have to think about other areas that I try to take over and use those as housing for the cattle. And so I'm gonna personally take this 15 minute farm principle that I've been talking to you guys about. It's okay girl, you don't have to be spooked. I'm just here to say hi. She keeps warming up to me. I might even start to try to halter train her, which could be suicide. I don't know. Oh, would you look at that touching scene? You got Amanda Hug and Kiss grooming Ariel. That's so adorable. Hi, Bonnie McMurray. You gonna let me get a scratch on you? Nope. I think Jeannie spooked her too. Amanda and Ariel went from grooming to fighting. That's weird. Keep learning so much by just watching the behavior of these cattle. So I would say that Ariel is like the number two cow in our cattle hierarchy. Amanda is the lowest gal on the totem pole. She's even lower than the calves because the moms stick up for the calves. You know, seeing them jockey like that has me wondering if Amanda's trying to move up the ranks a little bit. And so just a thought that I throw out to other folks who are out there thinking about their farms layout and design, it doesn't have to be some sort of weird dream utopia that you create where everything looks like it's plucked out of like an Ikea catalog. Oh, that's great. I needed a new blown. Did you get my schlab? I got a schlab for each of us. But I do think it's worth considering the layout of your farm and how you make yourself more efficient. And even though something might look really nice in a certain spot, if it doesn't make sense and it creates a whole bunch of extra labor for you, it might not be the best thing to do. But you know, as I think about the future of that farm and as it grows further too, the other thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna start utilizing more pasture than we ever had on our farm. And if I think about what's my 15 minute walkable limit, it's pretty much walking up to the top of that pasture is about the outer ranges of 15 minutes. Honestly, it's probably just about 15 minutes. I mean, it's probably only five minutes if you're taking like an ATV or something, but if you're walking, it ends up being 15 minutes. Oh, mom's dropping bombs. And so as I start to think about other infrastructure I might want to need or build, it does have me thinking about, well, what is my outer limits of 15 minutes? And how do I maximize my farm as much as I can before I expend that 15 minute limit? Oh, she was just licking my jacket. That's a good sign. Hey, Tobes. Oh, looks like Joey Ramon wants to say hi to Toby. Hey, Joseph. How's it going, buddy? Come on, Toby. So I don't know if I have all of my 15-minute farm recommendations, but I do know that the 15-minute farm is gonna end up being something I aspire to create here. If you guys wanna learn how we actually ended up finding this farm, I'll leave a link to this video up here, or you can watch something else. But I'll be back again soon with another video. Thanks for watching, everybody.